All right, everyone. Uh, this is the second session of the Health 2.0 and Digital Literacy course. Uh, once again, my name is Warren Wickman. I'm the Faculty Director of Instructional Technologies at the UC Irvine School of Medicine. So for this session today, we're going to talk about social media and Web 2.0. We're going to really talk about finding your voice and how all of these different aspects of interactive web content, dynamic web content, uh, patient, physician, end user, um, driven web contact affects how you practice medicine or how you could practice medicine or how you learn medicine or how you get involved uh, in medicine and the medical community. Now, there's a lot of different sites out there from Sermo to Vimeo, all of sort of different areas, a lot of things to cover. Uh, we're going to focus more kind of some broad strokes talking about the role of social media and to help us out with this discussion, we're very fortunate in our in-person session to have a guest speaker, Dr. Brian Vardabadian. He is a pediatric gastroenterologist from Texas Children's Hospital and assistant professor of Baylor College of Medicine. And I had met Dr. Vardabadian at one of the double AMC sessions uh, last year, and we got talking about what we're doing with social media and digital professionalism. And we kept in contact uh, since then, and he was very gracious to offer up about four to five minutes to an hour of his time where he Skyped in from his home, uh, joined us in the session. Now, we were unable to put something together to record and um, share his Skype session with everyone else. But what I've done is take sort of highlights from his talk and put them into some slides and use those as discussion points for us to go through throughout the course of this segment of the podcast. So a little bit about Dr. Vardabadian. He uh, kind of got started in social media in 2006 when he first published his book, Colic Solved. And at that point, there was no really... Uh, social media in the, in the terms of what we know it today. Uh, he was told at that point, if you're going to promote a book, the best way you can promote that book is to start a blog and talk about your book. And he initially started this blog, Parenting Solved, primarily with the intent of promoting his book. And since then, it evolved into this sort of patient discussion forum, discussing topics uh, relating to his book, relating to colic, relating to items in pediatric health or pediatric gastroenterology health or reflux that um, that were important to his patients and patients could reach out to him and uh, and interact with him and he didn't really realize at that time the benefit of social media until he made a post about uh, an impending Nestle and Gerber merger and he talked about in his blog post how that merger would change how we feed babies and eventually that post made it all the way up to some of the executives from Nestle who contacted him and engaged him in a discussion about what he was writing about and at that point he really realized that social media was uh, a platform that gave him this megaphone to the world and it was really exciting so from that point and around 2008, uh, when Twitter was still in its relatively early phases, he got involved with Twitter, uh, moved his current blog site, or moved to his current blog site, which is 33 Charts, and at that point, he started focusing more on physicians at the interaction of technology, uh, sorry, intersection of technology. And he wrote about personal issues, writes about personal issues, conflicts, things that are happening around him, technology trends, professionalism, all the things that sort of are good for colleagues, good for residents, and a little bit less on the patient care side of things, but at the same point, very, very important. And because of this um, discussion point, you know, at this intersection of technology and physicians and medicine, he's been invited to be a guest speaker at a lot of great forums, um, the double AMC, uh, looks like he's speaking at South by Southwest, um, a lot of great conferences, the pediatric conferences for the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, a lot of great venues where his expertise in this area is really valued and people look to him as role models uh, starting in social media as well as just a great colleague to follow along with and follow on Twitter. So before we go any further, I do want to say a very heartfelt thank you to Dr. Vardabadian for really taking the time out of his schedule for this course, which again, it's still a pretty novel new idea for what we're doing and taking an hour out of your time in the evening to join us was fabulous and the students were extremely appreciative as well as I. So we looked at a couple different questions with Dr. Vardabadian and the first one that one of the students asked was 
how do you approach interactions where patients reach out to you using social media? And this question comes up frequently, um, not so much by our students, but more by our faculty when they talk about Facebook and Twitter. How do you deal with this interaction of patient data? And the one thing that Brian Vardabadian points out is that this has been happening long before social media. You know, he would be out to dinner with his family and a patient would approach him and ask him a question uh, while they're having dinner about something relating to them or their child. Or, you know, a lot of you may be familiar with this where you have friends and family um, or just strangers that you kind of know as acquaintances that simply know that you're a physician or know that you're a medical student and ask you pointed questions about their health. How do you address those issues? Right now, it's a little bit harder <clears throat> to address that with social media because there isn't that direct face-to-face -face interaction. And so what can happen is that you can get an email out of the blue, what do you do with that, or a post on Twitter or Facebook. So he recommends four steps to approaching this interaction, the first of which is to take the conversation offline. So it says he'll, he'll contact that individual, tell them that this is not the appropriate space for this dialogue, and arrange a phone call or in-person visit. The second part is to actually address the problem or the question, and he'll do that um, as he normally would um, in his role as a physician. The third part, which I think is extremely important, is to have a brief dialogue with the patient about why public forums are not the places for these interactions. And the one thing he points out is that for the millennial mother or father to reach out to a physician or anyone via Facebook is extremely commonplace. Um, it's almost as common, and in some settings, um, you know, Facebook messaging um, supersedes texting and phone calls as the primary mode of communication. So for the millennial generation, um, the, the digital natives, this is a very normal day-to-day -day occurrence. On the flip side for us in medicine, uh, having these interactions through social media are extremely awkward um, and extremely just something we're not comfortable with or familiar with. So for us, there is that disconnect that they are used to this as the primary mode of communication, whereas we are not. And so we need to address that with them, that this is a big discrepancy between comfort levels of both them and of us, but it's not always just about comfort level. A lot of times patients aren't aware of the risks to them by posting up public data um, or data about themselves on a public forum. You know, a lot of them don't understand the privacy settings. They don't understand that, you know, their medical data now is permanently out there and a lot of them don't realize that there are risks to them by doing this. The other thing too is a lot of them, you know, in addition to not understanding privacy settings, some of them just don't know how Twitter works. He gave an example of where someone thought they were doing a direct message to him, but were actually just sending him a message on Twitter, so it went out to all of their combined followers. Uh, not a good thing. And then explain you know, some of the risks to the physician in engaging in this public dialogue, uh, privacy, HIPAA, all of those other items. He said after having this kind of discussion, usually it helps um, prevent further instances like that, but it also helps build that relationship a little bit closer between you and that patient. And then the fourth part, which I think is the most important that he talks about, is to document the exchange in the electronic medical record, or if you don't have an EMR yet, just document the exchange in the patient's chart. And it's really important that when you're documenting this, that you write down that it was the patient that initiated this dialogue in a public setting. You took it offline, explained these four points that you went through, and then you have a note to reflect this medical interaction, because that's what it is. It's a medical legal interaction. And now he says that you know it's, it's important to realize that dialogues between patients and physicians, um, if, they're, if possible, should always be encouraged. And social media can be a very good place for collaboration and sharing. The only caveat is to not include patient-specific data. And maybe one day in the future there will be applications embedded into the electronic medical record that have these kind of patient-specific conversations that are easier than, say, Secure Mail or Voltage or one of those other services, but we're just not there yet. So, uh, second question from a student, a uh, pretty open-ended, broad question, but is there any general advice or thoughts for students regarding the use of social media? And what Dr. Vardabadian noticed um, over the past couple of years is that there's this a shift in the approach of institutions to social media. Initially, it was viewed as a, as a liability, as a risk. Um, you really want to shut it down as much as possible because 
bad things can happen when students go online. That's starting to change a little bit, not completely across the board, but in a lot of programs he's noticed this shift that they're starting to view it more as an opportunity, uh, opportunity for engagement, opportunity for sharing, opportunities for collaboration, which is sort of the hallmarks or tenets of what social media can do. And schools and institutions are starting to look at this a little bit more closely. Now, it's not a complete 180 from before, but it's getting there. And one of the things he talks about, you know, for students or anyone getting involved is really the most important thing to keep in mind is your digital footprint. Now, if you're not familiar with the term digital footprint, um, it's, it sort of describes what people see and understand about you when they search online. Um, you know, and for a homework assignment, what you should probably do right now is, you know, hit the pause button and go on Google or Bing or your search engine of choice and do a vanity search. Search for your name. Search for Warren Weekman, MD, or search for your name and see what comes up. And this is what you mean by the digital footprint. And you sort of want to ask yourself, <clears throat> you know, is the content that is popping up on these search engines the content that you want reflected to the general public because if you're doing it right now there's a possibility that patients prospective employers anyone else in the world can do the exact same thing you're doing and is this the best image you want to put forward of yourself so when you talk about this digital footprint um, there's definitely this two different perspectives of risk versus opportunity and you can be in the mindset that you know, of the risk side, you know, being very risk averse, that anything you say, do, or post online represents a risk to your reputation, to your brand, to your footprint. Or you can take the opposite approach that anything that you say, do, and post represents opportunities or can create unique opportunities for you. And so what you really want to do is try and find that balance of risk versus opportunity and create a profile about yourself that is deep and rich and truly represents who you are or who you want to be. Now, one thing Dr. Vardabadian Vardabadian talks about is this culture of permission. And um, he kind of talked about this in one of his sessions at the AAMC um, and gave an example of just medical students and they're having a kind of impromptu chalk talk brainstorming session and they're talking about you know how do we prepare ourselves in medical education for our digital future the students had a lot of great ideas and uh, at the very end of the discussion he said this is great let's go ahead let's make a blog post let's put it up on 33 charts let's talk about you know let's, let's share these great ideas that we've had and he said the room got silent and the student says well you know do we need to get permission to do that and oftentimes, you know, what, what Dr. Vardabanian notices, at least in his institution, and I can echo in institutions that I've taught at and been involved in, there is this kind of culture of permission that is set up with our medical students and our learners that, you know, we are a little bit fearful ourselves of sharing our thinking and innovating, and that can sometimes make our progress be a little bit blunted. And, uh, you know, our medical students have brilliant ideas uh, but when you bottle them up into these little packages that are sort of cookie cutter medical students, oftentimes you don't let them uh, express themselves and innovate. And we found that here with our IMEDED initiative that we sort of loosened the reins a little bit and gave, gave them more ownership. They've come up with amazing things. And I think by thinking about this whole culture permission that's very pervasive in the medical school experience, and giving more flexibility to the students gets gets them a little bit more um, open to the idea of social media and sharing experiences and trying new things. And the one thing that you know Dr. Barbadian you know, talks about is by sharing your thinking uh, publicly. It's a very valuable exercise. And a lot of what we do in medicine is sort of exercise driven, and practice makes perfect. And that's how you get better at what you're doing. And he was saying, you know, it's when you when you see when people see you think publicly, they want to talk to you, and amazing things can happen. And I think it's just this level of engagement and openness and sharing that's very different than what we're used to. That I think is important to think about with your digital footprint. That there can be a lot more opportunities than risks if you realize that they're out there. So next question: How do you address issues? that arise when patients rate physicians online or using social media. 
So this kind of goes on to the discussion about all these physician rating sites, all of these comments that people can put up about a physician, um, most of which are good, but there are some that can be bad or just completely incorrect. Um, and how do those affect you as a physician online? And the one thing that I think it's important to realize, he said, is that you cannot control the conversation that is happening online. Once it's online, it's really out of your hands um, and it's up to the general public or to yourself to contribute. But once it's out there, it's out there. You can't really change what happens to it. Um, and so you have to be prepared for this risk when you go into practice. And um, this is going to be a risk that's going to be there throughout your entire career. Um, and the one way that you can counteract negative reviews or bad experiences online is creating this robust digital footprint. Um, you need to create so much kind of good content or positive content that's really reflective of you that one bad comment uh, will be sort of lost in the plethora of good comments. So one thing he talks about is this, uh, you know, Lee Ace, uh, Lee AC from uh, Mayo Clinic, he's created this site called the Social Media University Global or SMUG. And, um, you know, what he's talked about here is, you know, with this concept of creating so much good content, his, uh, one of his sayings is the solution to pollution is dilution. So creating such a robust digital footprint that one or two bad reviews won't really make a dent in what comes up when people search for your name. Um, and there are services that help out with this. Um, and there are just little things you can do as a physician, as anyone that's making a lot of posts, is that you have to encourage people that are pleased with your services or pleased with your work to make positive comments or make positive feedbacks. Or if you want to establish yourself as someone using social media, you need to post a lot of information that's good um, so that that's the stuff that comes up when people associate your name with an online search. Now, kind of the flip side, the flip side, of this is you know you can take the approach as this plastic surgeon did is you know they sued their online reviewers who gave her bad reviews now um, the problem with that is something called the Streisand effect so this plastic surgeon uh, sued a couple online reviewers and when the media caught wind of this um, it went crazy so the media wanted to find out more and more who is this doctor who are these reviewers and they kept referencing and citing this web page and citing the stories and created all this commotion and all this buzz about this lawsuit on a couple of bad reviews that now the only thing that dominated this physician's name when you searched was the bad reviews and the discussion around those bad reviews and this is called the Streisand effect and it comes from you know, there's a great story on Wikipedia about um, you know, why it's named the Streisand Effect, but pretty much it's a phenomenon where an attempt to hide or remove a piece of information has the unintended consequence of publicizing the information more widely. And this can happen with anything that you do. Um, there's a couple examples of, um, on CNN, there was some footage with the Haiti relief efforts of a couple of medical volunteers who on their downtime had a picture taken of them where one of them was holding a rifle and one of them was holding a bag of liquor. And uh, there was a lot of bad publicity regarding those pictures. And eventually those physicians were exonerated for those um, kind of poorly chosen pictures. But now whenever you pull up the reference for those individuals uh, or Google those individuals names those pictures come up automatically and it creates this sort of bad stain or bad digital footprint uh, so the Streisand effect is pretty interesting if you want to take a peek at it uh, online there on, on Wikipedia pretty interesting to read about and so and one of the other questions that comes up is you know are your patients aware of your blog and how do they feel about it so one thing that Dr. Vadian blogs about more now is kind of this intersection of technology in medicine not so much patients and patient education that was his previous blog the parenting solved and now he's focused more on uh kind of educating colleagues and residents uh and not so much direct patient care uh, the one thing he does mention is that patients really love to read what you write they love seeing videos they love seeing you sort of speak in action they like to see their physicians passionate and involved and i think Across the board, that's something that's very, very useful. Uh, and this, again, predates social media when people were involved in their community, when they were involved in doing uh, health fairs or putting commercials on TV or informational type services. Patients liked seeing their physicians involved. And now it's just a little bit easier to do that because of social media. 
Now he does talk about um, a couple of uh, you know people that are doing this very well. One of whom is Wendy Sue Swanson, and we're going to talk about her in a little bit uh, later on in the session. Now he has made one exception that he talked about, where he did write about a patient in one of his blogs, um, and it, the post, if you're interested in looking at it on 33 Charts, is called "And a Child Will Lead Them." It talked about a personal experience he had with one of his patients, where there was not um, the patient eventually uh, passed away, and he used this as an opportunity in conjunction with the family to talk about uh, his relationship with the patient. But again, this is a kind of a different circumstance because he, um, you know, mentioned the patient by name wanted to involve the patient's family in this post and so had been very explicit uh, consent from them to do so but that was as he said his only real exception to his rule about uh, what he blogs about and does online so do you use any other modalities to reach out to your patients so he primarily uses the 33 charts blog and his twitter account and his advice which is really good advice is to pick the medium where you feel most comfortable and able to keep up um, and it's really hard he said to make youtube videos to blog to post on facebook to update twitter to make new content in three or four different formats in addition to your traditional job and you know for us here with the course definitely could echo that statement you know we post in a lot of different formats and it is very time consuming to do triple quadruple posts of the same content in different formats so pick with pick something that you're comfortable with pick something that you feel that you can do on a regular basis because um, you know part of the creating this digital footprint is you know being regular about your content now it doesn't have to be just fluff content just to have it out there but something that's easy for you where if you have a great idea of information that you want to share or you had an interesting patient experience or an interesting experience with the technology that there's not a big barrier for you to share that with your social media following uh, if it involves making a video and then doing an hour of post-production on that video it should be very easy for you to do so that you can share very easily so now the concept of uh, professionalism perception had come up rather frequently and this kind of led to a longer discussion which is kind of hard to encapsulate in a couple of slides but the main thing that he wanted to bring up and I think is important that we reiterate is this kind of concept of professionalism and anonymous posts you know liberating or unprofessional and here's the link from American Medical News on amednews.com talks about this exchange um, uh, between Dr. Vardabating where he commented on um, some of these anonymous posters and a lot of physicians tend to use social media as an outlet for them to vent frustrations to kind of share their experiences in a way to sort of have that kind of locker room feel where it's like a safe environment for them to um, as I said vent their frustrations and you know they kind of talk about it here in this uh, this article you know the Twitter ha uh, name at Burb Doc describes himself as a suburban physician in the US uh, widespread notoriety 3,000 Twitter to fall Twitter followers um, you know where he makes comments that at the time may not be the most respectful for patients but you can sort of see them as being a physician how these are comments that you may mention kind of in jest to a colleague you're working with or out of frustration to a colleague who's there but when you start putting them online it sort of creates a very different tone um and so you know what dr verdabanian talks about is you know there's a lot of these kind of anonymous physicians who are out there making blog posts some of which cannot be viewed as the most professional and so you know that's sort of a a marker of how you you view professionalism in general you know through what window do you view professionalism um, as a physician are you always a physician uh, even online is there really anonymity anymore as a physician does this reflect poorly on physicians in general in social media um, you know I'm sure patients assume that at times um, you know we feel that they can be frustrating but do they really want to read about it um, you know maybe by the pure coincidence um, this person makes a post about a very awkward patient encounter and the patient happens to read it or it gets spread like wildfire and it becomes popular and the patient realizes it's about them you know what's the recourse then because now the patient knows who that physician is can they do something about that to correct this um, 
this inflammatory comment. So there's a lot of discussions back and forth about what your role as a physician, uh, what your role is as far as being anonymous, or even if that's acceptable. And this is a really good article talking about that. Um, I personally am in the belief, which Dr. Bartabadian shares, is that you should sort of take responsibility that you, um, as a physician, are no longer a private individual, and that you should have kind of the, your game face on at all times. And I think um, if you don't take ownership of your comments, then it really um, kind of minimizes or cheapens the whole experience of sharing on social media. And you know, if you do need a venue to vent, maybe social media is not the best place to do it. You know, you can still vent the old-fashioned way with colleagues in a room after your shift, or at a coffee shop, or at a bar, or at home with friends. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do that to 60,000 plus followers describing, you know, someone who had a terrible day, and you're going to make fun of them before it. The other thing that he brings up too is this idea of perception and misunderstandings. Um, and we had a great dialogue and exchange during our session where one of the students was inquiring about um, perception. And he actually put a post on 33 blogs. It's called Social Feed Misperception. Uh, I encourage you to take a quick read through it. Um, and what it involved was a discussion at the American Academy of Pediatrics about circumcision. And um, one of the tags or names was at family penis. And by kind of glancing through briefly um, the whole feed and the discussion, there's a lot of penis references. I think someone else's name might have had the word sexy in it. And so there was a misconstrued title of sexy penis. And um, at a pure um, bystander to the whole discussion, reading, you know, that there's all these penis references and sexy penis on someone's uh, Twitter feed made you sort of question what exactly was going on. And the one thing he talks about in this post, and we, we kind of went through throughout the course of our of our discussion, was that, you know, in social media, um, you know, perception really is about how we appear to the general public. And oftentimes perception is completely out of your control and that you're going to be misunderstood constantly. Uh, all the time you're going to be misunderstood. And so if you're not part of that dialogue, you may not get the references that are there. And so it's kind of hard that you may be having a very appropriate conversation amongst you and your peers uh, or sharing appropriate information that uh, to those in the know is okay. But as a pure member of the public or a pure outsider looking at this, it looks pretty suspicious or suspect. And again, what he talks about in that blog post is that it's you know a pretty legitimate conversation, but uh, at first a glance, um, it looks pretty weird. So something he talks about is this level of misunderstanding and being misunderstood, and a lot of it comes through this idea of microstyle, uh, and this is sort of this new idea of effective communication in short form. There's a great book uh, by Christopher Johnson called Microstyle: The Art of Writing Little. And that, you know, effective communication in short form is extremely hard to do in 140 characters. You can share information, you can share links, you can make little posts here and there, but it's hard to convey a lot of good information in very short form, which is why sometimes you need a Twitter feed and a blog post where the blog post elaborates on what you're posting on Twitter. At the same point, too, depending on your level of humor or your sense of humor, Things like that don't necessarily translate well into print and may not even translate very well into 140 characters. So very um, good advice to be cautious about how to make effective and concise communication using this very, very short form. And then one of the final um, questions here is, uh, do you have any recommendations for us starting to build our digital footprint? How do you shield yourself regarding personal stances or affiliations? And um, you know, a lot of this came from you know, a lot of our students are very active, either politically, or in societies, or in their religion, um, or in groups that may be controversial in certain circles. We have a lot of students that are uh, very supportive of Planned Parenthood. We have a lot of students that are uh, young Republicans or Democrats. All these different things that help define them as an individual. But at the same point, they recognize that these affiliations can be polarizing to some degree. Um, and so one of the things he recommends up front is kind of avoiding all discussions of politics and religion. Um, and the main thing he talks about, especially now or recently in this whole election cycle, is if you're going to be using Twitter or short form or micro style, there's no way in 140 characters that you're going to change someone's mind. Um, that whatever you post on Twitter is going to make people think, 
you're right. I should become a Democrat now. I should be pro-Obama or pro-Romney or pro-Republican or pro-life or pro-choice because of your 140-character tweet. That's never going to happen. Or it may, but for the most part, it's never going to happen. So don't use that as your venue to um, potentially polarize your audience or alienate your audience because you have a lot of followers and they don't always have the same belief system or same political views or affiliations. And by making a statement like that, you can polarize and alienate your audience. Um, the one thing he talks about too is you know mentioning work in a positive regard because again, patients like seeing physicians who are engaged. And if they see that you're unhappy or frustrated with work, it's going to kind of uh, reflect what kind of physician they think you are going to be. And it's not necessarily going to be how you actually are, but again, it goes back to that concept of perception. They perceive that you're going to be frustrated with them. They perceive that you're going to be tired and cranky, and um, that's what they're going to look at. And then he, one of the things he recommended too is starting out neutral. Um, as you're building your career, as you're building your footprint, you know, avoid concepts that can be polarizing. And then you know, later on in your career, when you become popular, when you're in a position of power, when you're department chair, when you've got 60,000 followers, when you've established yourself as um, a social media presence or as an entity, so maybe at that point you can start looking at things that are more, more polarizing. You can start voicing political views or beliefs because at that point you're not trying to build yourself up you're established at that point the other thing too he recommends is when you're looking at you know where do you start with your content like where do you, what information do you start posting he put an, a great post up on uh, his blog site there called repurposing physician knowledge there's a lot of great information that we have as medical students residents and attendings a lot of kind of uh, content that we can post and share with the world and this is a great place to start looking at that content and it's not always up to you to build that content you can collaborate with peers and share that content together and this is a great area to get started when you're putting up content and building that footprint so finally um, closing thoughts from Dr. Vardabadian um, you know students residents and learners are really the most important part of this whole process of digital literacy and professionalism. And the one thing that he really wants people to do is to either reach out to him via his uh, Twitter or blog site is um, you know to really reach out and you need to tell us, um, you know, your educators, your faculty, your role models, tell us what you need to be taught, what you need to know, what we need to be teaching you to get you better prepared to be a digital physician of the future. Um, you know, you have to be educated about what's out there. You really have to think before you act. Um, and again, in this whole social dialogue, perception trumps reality. So with that, you know, we have this great session with Dr. Vardabedi. And again, I want to thank him for his time. Uh, he did a really great job there uh, helping us out with a lot of good questions.